Hello, this is Kathy Salisbury, the director of the Ambler Arboretum of Temple University. And today for our virtual walk, we're going to explore the research garden, which is a one acre garden fenced off. That is the garden for the landscape architecture and horticulture program and part of the greenhouse education and research complex that we have here on campus. And so joining me today, I have a guest information provider with me today and that's Ben Snyder. He's the manager of the complex and the greenhouse horticulturist and also an alum of the program. And so Ben's going to answer questions I have about this space and uh, show us around. So you ready Ben? Yeah. Okay. So this garden houses the food crops class and food plants, right? And what do we do with the food? So all the produce that's grown here is donated to local food pantries. Uh, last year, or previous years, we've donated over a thousand pounds of fresh produce. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I guess there was a little pause in that this Slight year. Slight pause this year. But, but um, we'll get it back and growing. And so Ben is keeping the gardens ready to go for when we're able to have class uh, in person again and grow food crops again. And so Ben, what are we looking at here? These tall grasses. This is a hybrid sorghum grass, which is being used as a cover crop. So it's keeping down weed pressure and preserving soil and preventing erosion during this inner, during this time when we have nothing planted in terms of food crops. Great. And you said that this is a good cover crop because even in the shade, it stays nice and dense. Yes, yeah, so it'll be shorter in the shade, but it'll still be dense enough to crowd out the weeds. As you can see in the research garden, not only do we have row crops and vegetables, but we also have a nursery with trees and some shady spots too. All right. And you also have some cover crops down in here. Yeah, the first rows we come to have crimson clover, which will overwinter and then grow next spring and flower. So the next rows past that are winter wheat. Oh, so these are the clover. And then down here, is the wheat. So it's nice to have different examples of cover crops and see what they do to the soils. How do you decide what you're going to put in? This is all based off of a rotational pattern. So the crimson clover is a legume, so that'll put nitrogen back in the soil. And then we'll rotate that with a grass, so the wheat or the sorghum grass, and that provides a different soil structure, uses different nutrients. Cool. And what are these monsters? These are hardy bananas, Musa Baju. Um, so they're being used as a research project by um, Sasha and Josh Kaplan um, for the LA Hort Department. And they're looking at how to use them for biofuel production. Wow. So like green energy yes. kind of research? Excellent. So, so research goes on in here and also there's classes that, that have their practical application portion of their class in here. So they learn planting and caring for plants and that kind of thing. While they're here, more bananas. And here we have, you've been generous enough to allow the Arboretum to have a um, row of plants in here that are for our cut flowers because we do well, usually in normal years, we have events that we host and um, uh, we also help with different departments around the university by creating flower arrangements and that kind of thing for various events. And so we started a cut flower garden here in part of the research garden. And we also have future Arboretum residents. So this is our nursery plot here where we have various plants that we've gotten that were too small really to put out in the Arboretum. And so we're growing them on um, and then we'll transplant them out where we think that they are needed. So that's pretty exciting. And Ben, then you have this magnificent hedge here of bold colors. It looks very tropical and it can be seen from the road here. So you want to tell us about what's going on in this row? Sure. So this is a mixture of, like Kathy said, very bold, textured, and colored um, plants. So the tall red ones are castor beans, interspersed with some canas, 
And then the main plant species and um, genera that you'll see in here are salvias. So we do have a collection of non-hardy tropical salvias. So the one you look at now is salvia lucantha, a Mexican bush sage with very fuzzy flowers. Many of these salvias are very late to bloom, so they've only started blooming in the past two or three weeks, and they'll bloom up until frost. And so you said that these were left over or part of a research project earlier in their in their lives? Yeah, so this is one of our former students, Cindy Ahern, was looking at how salvias are used by different pollinators, specifically hummingbirds. So they had amassed a collection of different salvia cultivars and were comparing nectar values for those cultivars. Excellent. And who's this beautiful chartreuse? That is Salvia Mexicana Limelight. So that is actually not even open yet. When the flowers open, there'll be a dark purple, um, bluish color flower that pops out with the lime green bracts um, to contrast. That is so cool. And then we have this one. That is a hybrid salvia. That one is Ember's Wish. So there's a whole wish series. That's a complex group of different hybrids, but there's lots of different flower colors in that group. And you're I always wave hi when you can see the shadow. Hello, everybody. And we have this. Did we look at this one already? Oh, yeah, the velvety, the velvety one. I just, oh, and then we have this two-tone. Looks like fireworks. So that's one of the common names, giant firecracker plant or Mexican cigar plant. Um, Poofia micropetala, very good hummingbird plant. Not a salvia at all. Yeah, different family. It does look like the... There's a shorter plant, right? That the yes. little cigarette the firecracker plant, or yep. cigar plant. Really cool. And the white one. So the one you're looking at now is a cultivar of the salvia lucantha we saw earlier. The cultivar is called White Mischief. So everything like that is all white. And have you noticed hummingbirds in the garden? Earlier in the season, there were a few. It's trying to get past their season now. But the honeybees and bumblebees are still out enjoying these. And this one is the... This is arrowleaf sage, salvia sagittata. Named for its leaf shape. Yes. It is um, very early to flower comparatively, and also gets a lot taller than our other salvias. And this one is incredible. This is one of my favorites as well as everyone else who on campus looks at it. This is the Bolivian sage, Salvia boliviensis. And it gets these very fuzzy pinkish red flowers. Looks like a Muppet to me. There's little um, insects on it. Maybe ants? Oh, that is just so cool. I really didn't know about all these different salvias. And do you um, overwinter these or do you take cuttings of them to propagate them? Or? Most of these are overwintered by cuttings. Uh, because salvia, as a general rule, root very well from cuttings. Uh, a few of them I will dig up the root stocks for, cut them back and dig up the root just to get a bigger plant for next year. And did we talk about this one? We did, right? Uh, we did not talk about that. Oh, okay. That is also different. This is Salvia guaranitica. Uh, there's a lot of different cultivars. This is a straight species. Uh, very popular, common name anise scented sage. So oh. the leaves have a scent like anise. Nice. All right. Well, thank you. What's going on here with this giant leaves? So that is one of our two polonia trees that we have in the research garden. Uh, this is just an example of a different tree maintenance technique. Um, this, these are being coppiced. Eventually that means every year we cut them back to the base, so about six inches above the ground, and then they regrow. So all this growth you see is one year's growth. So cool. All right. And now we're on the other side of the research garden towards the corner of Loop Drive, Loop Road, and the and Meeting House Road. So this is the other hedge that you can see from the corner. Also bold 
big leaves looking tropical, more castor bean, mm -hmm. the ricinus communis here, more canna, and you have these that we've seen in other places in the garden that we really just love. It does so well. What is this again? So those are the cranberry hibiscus. Hibiscus is a cella cultural mahogany splendor. And it's not hardy, but we can take cuttings of it and, and save it. Anything you'd like to tell us about the castor bean? Sure. So castor beans are really fun. Um, they make this giant bold statement with their big red leaves and all that growth is from one year. So they grow very fast from seed. Their one downside or liability is the seeds are poisonous, highly poisonous. They're in the Euphorbia family. So you don't want to plant it anywhere where it can accidentally be picked and eaten. But in here they're fenced off. The and then the ground cover that you have in here, this is sweet potato vine. And in the arboretum outside of this fenced area, we have trouble with this because the deer eat it. But this also looks really mature and quite substantial. So what have you done with so this? These we overwinter from year to year. So we'll dig up the tubers. Um, even though it's an ornamental sweet potato, it will still get the giant tubers as you would find with um, edible variety of sweet potato. Um, so you dig these up, they'll be three or four pounds each. And then we can store them in the greenhouse in a closet. Um, they don't need light. And then we plant them back out in the spring. Wow, three or four pounds. Mm -hmm. Do you, can you eat them, did you say? You can eat them because they are not bred to be edible. They're very um, starchy, very fibrous. And they taste healthy? Taste healthy. Gotcha. And you have a fig over here. And the fig is very interesting because I have figs at home and I cover them with leaves and I protect them from freezing. And this one you don't do anything to. Yeah, we do nothing to this at all. We don't even mulch it. We don't do anything. We just let it go. It will often die back to the ground, but it will then re-sprout. And in most years, we'll get a really good crop of figs off. And it's a certain cultivar that's better for this climate, right? Yes, this is Chicago Hardy. Um, so obviously very cold tolerant. I'm very jealous. I'm going to have to dig mine up and get this one instead. And then for the health food people, Besides figs, you also have a really interesting plant over here growing, which is hardy also. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who shop in the health food areas, um, if you've ever wondered what a goji berry looks like or a goji berry plant, that's this. So here's the plant and here's the flowers. And if you look, the flowers kind oh, and there's a, um, oh, what the heck is the name of that beetle? They're not good garden beetles, the spotted, like seven spotted, this guy. This one right here. Yes, but anyway, here's the flowers of goji berry. And if they look sort of familiar, maybe a little bit like your eggplant flowers or nightshade weed that you might find in the garden or in a field, uh, that is because they're related. They're related to tomatoes and potatoes and eggplants and peppers. And here's the goji berry. So it's hardy here. Is there anything else that I missed to tell about it? Yeah, that's about it. There are cultivars out there. This is a straight species. Some of the cultivars will have larger fruit. There's also another species of black goji berry that we just got a uh, group from seed this spring. So we'll then plant that out here next spring and compare the two. Cool, that's pretty incredible. You have some really neat things growing out here. All right, Ben, so we're gonna end today here at, a, at another salvia. We'll end our tour of the research garden. We didn't get to see the orchard, the fruit trees or the brambles the blackberries and raspberries but maybe we'll look at those when they have fruits on them so we can snack along the way so here's another salvia do you want to tell us about it sure this is pineapple sage salvia elegans uh, so many of you are probably familiar with this it's a great herb you can use it to make teas out of put it in iced tea it's really good some people even put it in fruit salads but aside from its culinary uses later in the fall it gets these beautiful red tubular flowers that hummingbirds love. 
as well as the honeybees, which you might be able to see are all over it now. There are various cultivars, the one you look at now is a straight species, and then there's cultivars with yellow leaves as well, so you have a longer season of interest. There's the, this, these are the yellow leaved? Mm -hmm. Not quite flowering yet? Yeah, they tend to be a week or two later than the straight species. It always seems like these flower just after the hummingbirds are stopped visiting anything, mm -hmm. and the hummingbirds would love them. And you reminded me when you mentioned about the honeybees is that the other feature that the research garden has is the apiary for the campus that's used for non-credit beekeeping classes and also our credit beekeeping classes. So they're, the bees are probably really happy. And probably the beekeeper is happy too, have all this salvia and these late flowers around. Well, thank you, Ben, for a tour of the research garden. I really appreciate it. And um, everybody, we hope to see you soon. Stay safe, stay healthy. Remember, if you want to visit the Ambler Arboretum at this time, we are asking everybody to mask up for your health and for ours. And uh, we can't wait to see you in the gardens. In the meantime, you can visit us to learn more about programs by visiting arboretum.temple.edu. Take care.